Oh, Doc Savage played at that rock festival. It might have been like 10,000 or something. We were like the second or third band. And then later on, J.R. Flood played. Of course, one of the big, huge highlights was the Brock concert, playing with the Guess Who and uh, Mash McCann and uh, some of the others on the bill. I mean, that was uh, quite an event. So I guess Brock, outside of Brock, was pretty big. Uh, it was myself, Paul Dickinson, Bob Morrison, Wally Tomchuk, and Neil Peart. After Woodstock, everybody wanted to do like an outside music festival or music concert. So Brock University did. And it ran all day. And they had mostly local bands. There were some Toronto bands. And we did probably most of our originals. But we ended with a Santana song. Uh, I think it was called Soul Sacrifice. Paul was playing it over and over. And Bobby was cooking on the Hammond. Wally was pumping it out on the bass. And Neil was, you know, really going on the drums. And the song ends. It's, it's a kind of a song that kind of has like a an orgasmic ending because it sort of hits the chord and it goes da 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 and breaks and then Neil Neil just went like into outer space man he just whoa he was going all over those drums and then finally hits the last chord da and it holds and I'm telling you it was like it was like an orgasm and the whole crowd they were lounging about sitting around the whole crowd came to its feet all at once at that final chord. Biggest buzz I ever had in my life. Biggest thousands of people just, whew, wow, man. It was probably in St. Catherine's Arena when we opened up for Lighthouse one time. I think that was pretty much full, that arena. Uh, Maple Leaf Gardens with the Stampeders back in 79, and there was about 25,000. We opened up for the Little River Band at that time. Oh yeah, Maple Leaf Gardens, O'Keefe Center, Massey Hall. If you played uh, Stormy Monday Blues, you're a bar band. <laughs> <laughs> over and over and over. By the time you get into the early 70s, then it's bars. They lowered the drinking age, and now all of a sudden we're, we're of age to play in the bars. The drinking age was 21, and the year I turned 21 is the year they lowered it to 18. <laughs> they dropped the age here, and so the bars filled up, the school dances, and... Uh, the likes of um, uh, the castle uh, disappeared. There was no need for them anymore. There was no more need to have teen town and sorority and frat dances and things like that. Uh, the high school dances, I guess, probably persisted for a bit longer, but even they petered out. And then along with that, there was a change in bar music. They went country and yeah it, was, yeah, it was terrible. I remember the Atlanta Hotel went country. And I'm thinking, man, the best thing they ever did was tear that down after that, you know. But it used to be a lot of fun there at one time. You know what? I think it took a lot away uh, from the music. It lowered it because you're playing the drunks. I didn't like spending six days out of the week in some town that I didn't know anything about, in some crappy little room. And what do you do when you're not playing? The whole bar scene took took on a different. Uh, it was an alcohol environment, and um, it just uh, just wasn't the same. You know, what do you do for 12 or 18 hours when you're not playing? You know, you sit in your hotel room. Granted, you go, you wander around, you go to the library, you smoke, you drink, but you know, we all got into it because that's what we love to do. But when it becomes the job, 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 job that doesn't compensate very well, and then all that kind of stuff. It's tough to, to remain really thrilled or positive about what you're doing. I mean, bars is for the much more mature bands and older bands, but as far as the rock bands in this area, we weren't out to start a band to play in a bar. A lot of us kept playing, but I mean, for years, that was what I did, you know, up until, um, you know, basically about 73. People were becoming much more discriminating you had to be, you know, if you were going to do a, a cover song, you had to be pretty much damn bang on, right? And even your sound system had to be better. Your light, you had to have lighting, and and a lot of bands had to carry audio guys, you know, to work aboard. Um, it just became a much bigger kind of venture. Were you around at the end of the majority when they became the Titanic? Yeah. What happened at the end? I think, you know, at that time, Rick Peel and those guys wanted to go do their thing, and 
Uh, Bob was still more into the pop sort of thing, maybe a little bit too much for Rick. The guys that asked me to play in that band, I had already been watching them for a few years in other bands, and so it seemed, you know, oh, here's my big chance. Titanic was all straight ahead rock as a four-piece band, you know, guitar, bass, drums, and a vocalist. Greg Uznoff took it a step further than anybody else playing bass. He was really getting your face type of playing. He had a mountain of speakers behind him and he played really hard so it would it would distort just a little bit so it would have that really aggressive sound, you know, sort of like a Tim Bogert kind of guy. Peel was, I would say, the leader, and Mark was the front man singer. He had a about a three octave range. He could he could actually do that very high, like Robert Plant type stuff, and could actually pull it off. And he worked hard at it. He was good. He was a pretty good showman too. He was he could get he could hit the notes, and he liked the Roger Dalter thing, you know, throwing the mic out and bringing it. He was pretty good at that. We'd tape his mic up so he wouldn't rip the cords out of him. Rick really had a lot of experience. Rick had played with a lot of bands and played a lot of gigs, and, and he had a good personality to, to meet people and get in there and try and at least sort of take us in a certain direction, I guess you might say. And Jimmy was uh, Jimmy was around for pretty much the whole time. He, he was pretty knowledgeable about the whole business, and he's still in the business as far as I know. We opened up for Alice Cooper. I remember Alice Cooper. They were kind of crazy afterwards drinking and stuff. I was young, you know, and it was kind of different for me. We played with Downchild in one of their early incarnations on a bill with a band called Flood that became uh, ultimately Saga. And uh, a band called Rhinoceros, I don't remember uh, anything they did, but I know they had an album out at the time, which seemed like a big deal. At one point, you know, you've got people, their main objective is to dance, and now they're, they're watching you. And you're you know, you're the you're in the spotlight. You got to be good. So I I remember being nervous a lot, and uh, everybody was trying to steal everybody else's following all the time. All the egos of the different bands started to interplay with each other, which was yeah, sort of stupid. But yeah, they were still going when I was gone. But you know, writing was on the wall everywhere. You know, it was just kind of going downhill. Guys were always rumbling about maybe doing something different. Plus, it was wasn't much money in it, at least for me. <laughs> Yeah, and then by the time we hit Bull Rush, um, still doing schools, but then we did start playing a lot of clubs. And a lot of road work, a lot of road work. We used to play a lot, I think it was in Bull Rush, was um, the waterfront down on the lake, and that was, that was big for us. Our manager at the time, Tom Schmidlin, was doing a lot of the booking. For Bull Rush, I uh, worked with Dennis Brander for a while, and um, Tom Schmidlin was under that like, Hab Productions with Tom. And as we broke into Toronto, then we were picked up by Cliff Hunt and Barry Colbus, but they kept us on the road for quite a while. Well, we could really clean up in some places. We used to go in and rather than play a flat fee all the time, we took percentage of the door and really made out very well. But uh, Bull Rush had a few original tunes, yeah, but they went over really good. Brian Gagne was a, a terrific songwriter. Bull Rush was Bull Rush in St. Catharines. I don't know who stepped up to that point. I'm not being smart. I mean, just that's the way it was. A lot of band, local bands don't stand out with me at the time, other than the guys from Thorold. Hush. Rick Leather, he was, uh, well, he could play anything. He was quite the guitar player. With Hush, Rick, Rick, Rick was a dominant fork because he was one of these guys who was just, he was a natural musician. Um, he liked the Buffalo Springfield. He liked Stephen Stills and the Neil Young stuff. So we started to do some of that stuff. Uh, Brian Collins liked Traffic. We used to do a couple of songs where the intricate timings, a band called Flash. Wishbone Ash, we were doing some stuff because of the dual guitar stuff. We got into later on um, some of the progressive stuff. We were trying to do Todd Rundgren. The music got a little more complicated. Harry McNulty was the singer for Hush. At that time, my brother Bob was playing bass. Brian Collins was on guitar. Jamie Ralston was on drums. Yeah, Rick Leather was also on guitar. We played universities, a couple of big concerts with April Wine, uh, a band called Cactus. Well, actually, they're guys from Vanilla Fudge, but they just come back from a stint with uh, Jeff Beck. 
I felt like I was in a band, <laughs> you know, I felt like this was actually a band actually working towards something and, and put together this album. And then when, when I left the band, one of my going away gifts was a, a copy of this album with our poster on the front and I thought it was great. So Harry left, so, uh, so yeah, I, I joined uh, Hush. That would be the second version of Hush. That morphed into a third version, which ended up being uh, Neil Peart on drums, Paul Lowe's on guitar, my brother still on bass, uh, Brian Collins still on guitar, and myself on vocals. And that's, that's the version of Hush that uh, Neil Peart was playing drums with when he heard that there was this band from Toronto uh, as, a, as a trio. And um, they were looking for a drummer. Um, Neil ended up getting the gig. <laughs> <laughs> so Hush broke up after that and reformed as Star-Lord uh, with some different guys. What would you do different? I'd fire myself. Hire a bunch of guys to uh, be our roadies. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be more wary of the people we dealt with. At the end we, were, we weren't having fun and we just kept on going for a little while longer. Probably should have packed it in a little sooner. I think maybe I would have just stuck with it. Uh, I wish I, I learned more about the electronic things. Like Jimmy Johnson was good with that, you know. And I was mainly just, you know, carry this and do that. And Practice more, <laughs> knowing that it can happen. Looking back, I probably could have did, you know, that much more. I didn't, didn't see the future in it, which I was wrong. <laughs> in retrospect, I now realize that, you know, I had as much ability as anybody to learn how to play. Uh, and had I maybe, you know, really taken it more seriously early on, it would have been um, better for me as, as a musician. The loneliness and things like that, but that's the road. That's just living life on the road. I spent a lot of years like all the other musicians had on the road, you know, gone for months and months and months of time and then coming home. But uh, no, it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed a thing, really. Focus on playing original material. If you have the ability, if you have good songwriting, and so many have, and it didn't work out, but the best chance you have is if you have your own stuff, absolutely. You had to get out and flog yourself, if that's the word, everywhere. You couldn't just rely on your manager and your booking agent. You had to do it yourself. You had to make demos. You had to phone uh, recording companies and say, may I please come and give this to you? You had to be like some of the guys that became rich and famous. You had to do it 24 hours a day. You get uh, into a situation where you have to, you know, feed the machine, so to speak. You end up playing anything and everything and any gig anywhere to, to make a, a buck. And now you've lost sight of that, uh, your goal. And your goal is now just to survive. If you're going to make nothing, you might as well go for it, I guess, right? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> I remember taking the bus downtown to play the Lyceum, a uh, place which no longer exists, on a street which is really not there anymore. Can you explain that one-handed roll? Neil Peart asked me the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Only I wouldn't tell him. I've been in better bands since, but there's something about the first band, like you know, proving you could do it. It was a petition signed petition. by the people of Falls South that we are to get out of town. <laughs> <laughs>